Good morning, good evening, good day to you, wherever you are. This is Al here. I, uh, I thought I would do a little bit of a poll the other day on YouTube, and I asked people what their favorite decade of computing was going to be. If you could pick a particular year, what would it be? Um, and I have my favorites. I know what I think. And I'm going to talk a little bit about exploring all the different ages of computing in the 20th century and well, maybe a little bit into the 21st. But um, it was quite clearly a winner in the poll, which had 222 votes, which was a lot, long, lot, lot more than I expected. Um, it's quite taken away the, how many votes that uh, we got. So that's cool. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to rekindle some memories of the uh, bygone days and I have Wikipedia up to help me a little bit with that but I, I just think it's fascinating to to see that most of us that are at least fans of the Geek Lab have very similar kind of thoughts and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rekindle some thoughts and memories and I'd love to get your feedback. So stick it in the comments below. And uh, yeah, also don't want to forget to remind you, if you like this sort of participatory stuff, that's a big word for this time in the morning, uh, then you can head over to either um, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab, it's right there. And you can also go on to Substack and now have Substack Pretty much the same stuff goes on there, so if you've got a particular um, favor for either Substack or for Patreon, then the, in the basically all the articles that go up on there are the same. Uh, it just means there's now two places for me to track all the, all the things, uh, which is a pain in the backside. But there was a number of people that wanted to have a Substack. Uh, because they didn't like Patreon for some reason, and that's okay. So anyway, check me on patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab or Al's Geek Lab, Geek Lab dot Substack dot com. You can get me there. Now, anyway, on with the show. Um, so, as I say, I did this poll, and I wanted to explore why I like particular years in computing and the feelings that they evoked. So let's have a quick look. Before we do that, let's have a look at the the days of computing. Now, if we think about computing from the 1940s, because that's really when it all started in in Mac. I mean, we could go back to Babbage if we like, and Ada Lovelace, and all those wonderful people. But <clears throat> the computing world kind of started in the 1940s. Um, with the event of the the World War, what the Second World War, right? And you know, if we talk about computers from those days, then they kind of evoke images like this: great hulking big machines. Some of them relay based. Some of them were like mechanical, like totally mechanical. There were totally mechanical computers. Most of them were electro mechanical, and some were completely digital. But um, they, they were far and few to, to, between. So they had the Eni, ENIAC, the V2, um, I think it was, or a Z2, sorry, the V2 was something completely different. Um, so the Z2 was actually the first computer. And if you don't know about that, you should check it out. I, th I read a recent Substack, I can't remember off the top of my uh, head, but uh, basically called out that Germany in the war times um, actually created the first proper computer. And a lot of people, uh, like what we classify as, so that's, Anyway, completely deviating off track there, but I found that um, very fascinating. I think I knew that deep down, but um, it was quite interesting to see the detail on that. So whilst USA claims to have made the first computer in something like this, the, uh, the, this is the ENIAC, hey, I was right, um, the actual first computer is probably German. Um, now, anyway, uh, let's have a look at what the well the forties and the fifties. Really, nobody um, is a particular fan of those particular eras. Now, if you disagree with me and say, "Hold on a minute, Al, come on, bald guy," <laughs> I think that the forties and the fifties were the golden age for computing. Then tell me in the comments why. Don't just say, "Hey, you're wrong, Alster." Just say, "Tell me why." And I, I'd love to hear why the 40s and the 50s are the best days of computing. Now, um, here's the 60s because I don't really know many people that talk about uh, computers from the 40s and 50s. Um, 
is way before my time. And so the, the companies that were really in the 40s and 50s were kind of still around by the 60s. And things had evolved a, a reasonable amount, um, but the systems were, you know, a lot of the, we've gone from valves mainly into using transistor technology, or we're starting to have that period of time. But they were still huge, big hulking machines. I don't know if there's any pictures. There's a sort of late example. So 69, the Data General Nova, that's a sort of mini computer. But things had, things had evolved uh, a bit into container-based systems right, that had moved on. And so this was really the third generation. So it started in what it says here, 1966. Um, so yeah, low transistor accounts um, of machines. So yeah, so that was an important evolution in computer technology, really, we dropped the relays and the valves, and we're now moving into transistors. And that was, yeah, as it says here, around here, 1966. Um, but still, you know, everything was very slow, um, really kind of basic. And, you know, you had to have millions and millions and squillions of dollars to make those systems. So were they, were they really good? Were they, were they the, the pinnacle of computing? Probably not. So I didn't even start my poll um, with the 60s. I didn't even bother with the 50s or the 40s. I just went straight into the 1970s, which is where I'm going to go next. So this is another Wikipedia page, and it basically is just the the lifetime, I guess, of computers up to from the 1950s through to the end of the 70s. So let's have a look at the 1970s. What happened there? So this is um, so you had the first DRAM chip, which is insane that the DRAM didn't exist until 1970. I mean, wow, right? But Intel uh, made the first DRAM and it was it had 1K bit of memory, not a kilobyte, <laughs> 1024 bits of memory. I mean, that's just insane. Um, really low amount of memory, but yeah, it had DRAM of 1024 bits. Uh, the programming language fourth was created. Um, the data terminal was created. Now that was quite interesting um, because you know if we had if we think about the terminals before that particular time, 1971. If we go back before that, think about what we used to input data onto computers. They were either relay switches that you just toggled in some way or you punched in uh, like cables, you know, like <clears throat> like on the phone networks, like, you know, you, you the operator would take one cable and go to another patch port. That kind of stuff still existed up until, you know, the 60s, I guess. Then you had also, um, you had uh, teletypes. And teletypes were like a kind of printer, if you've never seen them before, they were like a printer but they also had a keyboard on them. So you could type away all your commands and whatever you typed, be it right or wrong, went on the printer. So it's kind of like an electromagnetic typewriter that also had an interface with a computer somewhere. So it had a cable that went off down, usually a serial line, and it went into a computer somewhere. Um, and so, yeah, it was basically a a terminal without a screen. It just used a um, a printer with paper. And it usually had a punched card reader on the side as well. And that punched card reader uh, sometimes was a writer as well, I think. But yeah, it could basically read programs in from a, a little piece of ticker tape like this size. And yeah, it was incredibly archaic. But so 1971 was the first year which is wild to think. I can't believe that. That really seems, it says a mass produced programmable terminal. But if we think about the moon landing, the Apollo mission in 1969, they were using some sort of display terminals. Um, so yeah, there must be there must be something to do with mass produced and the, the word mass produced there because Philco, I think with that was a Ford company, were making display terminals for the Apollo mission. And that was obviously, in the 1960s but i mean still we're talking basic stuff here um noticing there that in 69 uh, rfc number one 
Uh, I don't know what RFC we are up to now. It is with um, the networking working group. Um, but that was the first RFC and that was on the ARPANET, which then turned into the internet many, many years later. But uh, yeah, that's that. these are standards and things that were happening uh, really early on, but you know, were really pivotal to the world of computing, right? So all of these things were being set up. Uh, like this one here, the 8-inch floppy disk being introduced and, uh, introduced, and that was by Memorex, if I, um, you know, if I recall correctly. I think I talked about that on my recent Gary Kildall video series, and if you haven't watched that docu series, definitely tune into that. That's yeah, it was it was a labor of love of five or six months. Um, really important things started happening around then. Uh, the four four thousand four, the first micro -co -pro uh, microprocessor was released by Intel. Before that, there was no general purpose processors available. Right, so it was this discrete logic that was inside chips, but nothing specifically that used a microprocessor or general purpose processor as we know it today. So really, really important time. That was a four bit processor and it could do 60,000 instructions per second. Wow, yeah. So not even at a megahertz, it was at 740 kilohertz. Um, and then 72 Atari was founded by Nolan Bushnell and, Te and Ted Dabney and then not long after that they created the, or well, they didn't create the game actually, uh, Pong. Uh, Alan Alcorn did that. And then, um, so we started the fourth generation of computing after that, large scale integration of circuits. And um, yeah, so that was important. And then Bell Labs came along with Dennis Ritchie and they created the C language which was really cool. Uh, and then an 8-bit processor by, called the 8008 came along and that was released by Intel. And then we had the ARPANET, uh, which was really important because that gave way to the internet, as I said, and all these cool things. Um, the first graphical user interface was made, can you believe this, as early as 1973 by, the, by Xerox uh, at the park. And that was PARC, Palo Alto Research Center. Um, but this was by, it was a machine called the Alto, and it would be many, many years later, I mean, pretty much 10 years later, before we saw that being used in a way that could be brought to the masses. And that computer was called the Macintosh. In fact, there was pro probably a year before that, it was called the Lisa, which was, yeah, but it wasn't so popular. The Lisa was never a commercial success. So the computer that really everybody knew with the first proper graphical user interface was the Macintosh. But Xerox had the idea first and it was kind of stolen from them by Apple and by many others after that. So let's let's have a look through uh, here. There's a few other great ideas, things like TCP IP was created, Prolog, the TV typewriter was, th that was the first uh, basic uh, ability to <clears throat> use a TV set with a keyboard and see characters appear on screen. So that was quite early. But all these things really, really important. I won't, I won't bore you. But basically, the Mets Altair that was a really important thing. That was the first personal computer built on an eight-bit CPU. Um, that was a pivotal moment, you know, because before then we didn't have computers that you could take home and plug in. You literally, that wasn't a thing. All right, that was a really important time. So the Mets Altair was the first computer that you could take home. Most of them weren't assembled. You had to assemble the circuit boards yourself. You know, plug in the chips, solder them to the to the the, the, um, the PCBs, all that stuff. Um, don't forget the sponsor, PCB Way. PCB Way. Um, then we had. Um, the first version of BASIC, which was made by, well, the first microcomputer, I should say. BASIC had been around since earlier than this, but um, Paul Allen and Bill Gates copied it or converted it to microcomputers. So basically the, the Intel 8800 and so forth. Um, then Zunix came out in the 19, uh, in the mid, was marketed in the mid 70s, but it actually was started life in 69. Um, 
and all of these great things. Then in, then around the late 70s, sort of 1976, 19, yeah, 1976 was when the Apple I came out, uh, on, right here in fact. And then if we go look down here, um, Commodore bought out Moss Technology, and then 1977 we had the Trash 80 or a TRS-80, the Apple II came out, and we had the Commodore PET as well uh, in 1979. So there's a whole bunch of machines that came out around 1977. Uh, the TI-99, I think it's, don't know, it doesn't say that somewhere, but there was basically a, a trifecta of computers that came out um, in in 1977 and those were like kind of the first machines the desktop machines that people think of as desktop computers right so things were really heating up by the the late 70s i guess um 1977 or 8 saw the release of the 8086 and then the year later saw the, the release of the intel 8088 and the following year 19 or oh, 1980 was the year where the IBM PC was created. <clears throat> and really important software such as VisiCalc and WordStar were written in those days. So the first big web uh, word processors and the big um, spreadsheets were created. But that was the 1970s. So was there time in any of that where you go, oh, they were really personal for me? Was it really... Um, was it really cool? Were there things happening in, in um, computing that really made it like personal for me? And <clears throat> the answer there is probably not. And that's probably why if we look at uh, this poll, we can see that only 4% of the respondees chose the 1970s. Fair enough, because most of the time when you talked about computers in the 1970s, they were still these great big hulking machines that sat somewhere and were not personal, right? So people didn't have them in their homes, or at least not until the very late 70s. And um, really, it was still seen pretty much as a hobbyist thing and for nerds and so forth. It wasn't until the 1980s that things really made a, a change in the world of computing. And that's really because the prices of computer chips had come down so much that people could start making computers for people that would, they would take a punt on having a computer in the house. And there was lots of things that started happening that made people start to go, mm, this computing thing might, might actually be a thing. Um, for example, in the UK, where I'm from, they had um, a computer um, literacy program. Uh, they made a TV program on the BBC, they put money behind it, made a BBC computer, and all of a sudden there was other companies in competition as well, like for example Sinclair, uh, that made the ZX80 here in January of 1980. Now I have the follow-up to that computer, and as terrible as it was, here's the ZX81, the keys. I don't know, if, you can't even hear me pressing the keys. <laughs> it's a membrane keyboard, but it's tiny. The ZX80 um, was, both of these machines are Z80 CPUs. So it was a processor that was made, in, I think it was around 1976, 1978. And it was basically a, a better version of the Intel 8080. Um, but these machines were really affordable they were only about 100 pounds. Uh, so that was like 150 US dollars. Very affordable machines. And that was the whole idea with, behind Sinclair. Those machines could be taken by the average home user if they wanted to balance their accounts or write simple Word documents or something like that. They were really basic machines and uh, you could play games on them and a lot of people played games on them. These ones, the first ones, the ZX80 and the ZX81 were black and white and I think uh, if memory serves, haha no pun intended, the memory in them was about one kilobyte. Now it could be expanded through their expansion port but yeah it wasn't very much memory. One kilobyte of RAM. Um, so yeah, not, not very powerful. The game Pac-Man was released in uh, 1980 Trash 80 was upgraded um, 
to a color machine uh, with Microsoft Basic. And a huge development is the advent of the, uh, the completion of the um, the uh, IBM PC, which is just out of shot, which is behind me there. Uh, bear in mind that Apple, which is in shot, this one here, it, it created the Apple II in 1977, as well as the Tandy TRS-80, as I said. All of these machines had already gotten quite a way in to the, um, the microcomputer world. And so people were getting used to having computers of some description in the house and also in the office. And so IBM really thought they needed to catch up. But these were interesting times. So IBM realized that they had to catch up and that they did. They came out with the PC, the Intel based PC that had an Intel 8088, 8088, if you want to say it that way, um, PC computer. And it was a 16 bit machine. So all of these machines were 8 bit. Um, the, the apples behind me, uh, they were 8 bit. The TRS 80, all 8 bit. So the PC, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Apple II was based on the 8 bit 6502. And the TRS 80 was based on something else. I think it was the Z80. And these were based on the Z80 as well. So all 80 bit, 8 bit machines. This was the first popular 16 bit computer. And it had an address space of memory up to 600, well, actually a megabyte of addressable memory. Um, whereas the 8 bits could all the 8 bit machines could only address 64K. So let's move on a bit. I'm going to scroll through a lot of this. Um, the next big thing was Apple with its um, Lisa, which was a 16 bit processor, the 68000, um, which had a, me a megabyte of RAM and it was the first graphical machine that was in the mass market. And when I say mass market, it wasn't really successful uh, commercially, but because I think it costs something like $10,000. In fact, that's exactly what it says there. Um, but it was a pretty solid machine. And there's the Xerox Star, which it was kind of based on um, and so forth. And so we're really starting to see a massive shift in computing. Like a lot of things were happening here. Lots and lots and lots of really pivotal things were happening. Uh, um, the Sinclair QL, the Macintosh, there we go, that's a big date. Uh, the Macintosh, which is this thing. This is the second edition of the Macintosh, two floppy disks, but basically another 16-bit machine. That was a big day because, you know, a graphical user interface and it was relatively affordable. It had an eight megahertz processor, eight megahertz, I got told off by somebody for saying megahertz, megahertz processor, um, and it could address the 68,000 could address 16 megabytes of RAM. It only had a 128K RAM with it and a monochrome monitor, but it was much more affordable than the Lisa, although the Lisa was probably arguably a more um, powerful machine. It, it was much cheaper. It was 2,500 US dollars. Still a lot of money back in 1984, especially, but it was a real big deal. It, nobody had ever seen a mouse, far less a, um, a desktop graphical user interface. It was just a big, big time. Then we had the, the imminent release of the laser printer, um, the Amstrad CPC, which is a lovely machine. If you haven't ever played with an Amstrad CPC, I highly recommend it. It's a really nice machine. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Um, there was the upgraded Mac. It's the Fat Mac, which had 512K of RAM. And these were iterations. Um, Tetris came out. Commodore, Commodore 64 came out in 1982. That was a really important thing. How could I miss that? Where is it? Here, Commodore 64. That was one of the huge big things of 1982. Um, the BBC Micro came out as well, I think late 81 or early 1982. Um, really, really nice machine. Um, a lot of people in the US haven't played with the BBC Micro, but to be honest with you, not biased. I, I just think it is a really fantastic machine. The amount of expandability and uh, usability that machine has is just fantastic. It's just such a good machine. Well, well, go, uh, well made, 
um, 65028 bit machine. I know I'm jumping about a bit here. But look at all these things, you know, really starting to get out with some really mature, well thought out machines, um, really usable. And it was just a, a really interesting time for computers because there was all these computers starting to come out. You know, there was the, the Z, this ZX based machines from Sinclair. There was the BBC Micro. There was the Amstrad CPC. There was the Macintosh. There was the IBM PC. These are just the, the, you know, the big names. There were smaller companies making machines as well. There was lots of systems out there, lots of different companies making PCs. These are just the success stories, really. Um, you know, um, there was, uh, what else? The Commodore, Commodore, well, they, yeah, I mean, look at this, PCW, there was the Atari ST, there we go, Atari ST that came out in 1985, and the Amiga came out in 1986, and what those were was 16-bit machines as well. So these were kind of going, well, now we're into 16-bit land, but there was a hybrid going on where still a lot of machines were still 8-bit, and they were still selling really, really well, and they were really affordable, and then there was these new, more powerful 16-bit machines that could do a lot more. They had graphical user interfaces such as TOS on the Atari ST and um, Workbench on the Amiga. Um, whilst the PC was kind of languishing, it, it, there was, um, I think Windows 1.0 came out in 1985. So, you know, the desktop, the graphical desktop kind of eluded the PC for a lot longer than everything else. So Mac and uh, Atari and Amiga all had graphical user interfaces by you know 1985 so yeah it was uh, it was a, co a complex marketplace and nobody really knew who was going to win right so IBM are doing really well because nobody got fired for buy buying IBM but you had all these really cool computers as well that were doing sort of unique stuff like for example the Atari ST was I think the first computer that followed the MIDI standard. When the MIDI standard had only been introduced just a few years back, and I think it only was introduced in like 1981, 82, right? There it goes, 82, October. MIDI was the, um, does it say what it stands for? Musical Instrument D Digital Interface, right? So only by 1985 had the Atari AST come out, and that basically was a controller and a musical in instrument. And these, this was a really important thing all of these big, really proper utility um, uses for computers had started all of a sudden in the 1980s. Here's an important date. Um, sometime around December of 1983, Lotus 123 spreadsheet software was launched. And that, if it wasn't for Lotus 123, some people argue that the PC, the IBM PC, would never have taken the market by storm. That was the spreadsheet of choice. So VisiCalc up until then was the leader and we had Lotus123, it came along and it just, you know, people opened their checkbooks and said, here, take my money. Um, Microsoft Word came out, DNS, which is really important about how to get to an area of the internet by name. All these cool things. Um, so we had Commodore, you know, really doing well in the 8-bit market with the Commodore 64 and the Commodore 128. We had the ST from Atari and all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, things were things were really, really starting to be interesting. The, the 386 processor came out around 1984 or 85, I think it was. And um, it was just, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we had like, three, the 386 was a 32-bit um, CPU, I think. And it could uh, address, you know, 32, uh, 32 megabytes of memory or something? Oh no, no, four 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 gigahertz gigabytes of memory. That's a lot of memory. Um, so this is a really really important time for computers. And um, you know the EGA graphics adapter was released, which allowed you to see 16 colors instead of the horrible palette of CGA, which was four colors in in general modes. So a lot of a lot of stuff was was really changing. <laughs> 87, for me, is a really important year in computing. Lots of, lots of enhancements started, but the VGA graphics interface, 
came out for the PC, which allowed you to see 256 colors on screen, uh, limbs, EMS, uh, the ability to extend your memory above that sort of um, 640K or one megabyte area was released. Adlib was released, which was the first sound card. Um, so you could actually get digital sound out of a PC. Which, <laughs> you know, you could get digital sound on loads of other things. So the PC was kind of like, it was kind of encumbered. It was really stuck behind, but it was still being the most popular platform, really. It was quite a strange place to be looking at from, from now. But anyway, all of this stuff was, if I look back at 1987... I go, look at how mature everything was. Look at all of these things that we had on all of the different platforms. But there was something about the PC for me. Sierra had released the first um, few games, right? So I think the first proper uh, Sierra game came out uh, uh, was King's Quest. And I think that came out in 1984. But if we look at Sierra's catalogue of games by then, you know, Sierra were making these great adventure, graphic adventure games. So we had Leisure Suit Larry, we had uh, you know, a whole bunch of great games out by Sierra in 1987. And it was just something magical about that sort of period, the games that were uh, released. Let me see if I can just bring up quickly um, games of 1987. And this is not to say only the um, the PC games. Um, we have a lot of great games on lots of different platforms. The Commodore 64, although that it had been released in 1982, there were some amazingly good um, uh, games for 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 the Commodore 64. It was still thriving. Um, let's not do that. Uh, computer games, 1987. Let's see if that. Um, there we go. This is probably what we want. Hey, games like this. Outrun. R-Type. Uh, Super Hang On. Uh, Bubble Bobble. Operation Wolf. 1942. Right? Um, these were the computers that we were using at, uh, at home. We were using the NES. Okay, so the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Famicom, came out in 1984, 5, and that was the biggest selling game system. The Commodore 64 was number two. Uh, Master System or Mark III from Sega. The IBM PS2, PC Engine, Macintosh, PC88 stuff in Japan. Uh, Apple II, the Atari ST and the MSX, again mainly in Japan. So, you know, really, really cool video games. Let's see what else we've got here. These are all J Japanese. Don't haven't played any of them. F1 Race, that was cool. Loads of really good games. Um, the United Kingdom games were a bit different. But I thought that the games in 1987 were great. And I was tiny. I was just a kid in 87. But it was something about those those games and the type of computing that was around. So it's a combination not just of games for me, but also how computers worked. So we already had gone through this age of maturity in computing. Some really important bedrock items had started in the 1960s and 70s, especially in the 1970s, but then the translation of that into somewhat sort of reality had evolved into through the 80s. And so what you could do with your computers in the sort of mid to late 80s was a really great time. But if we think about computing in itself, and not just games, I love the fact that you could use your terminal on your PC or your Macintosh or your whatever, but your 80 column display on your computer to talk to other systems like Unix systems and stuff. But there's something about it, and even remembering back now, something about that text interface that I still love to this day. I, I You know, a Unix system has a special place in my heart, but even MS-DOS was important. But the fact that you could interface with terminals on other systems, you know, to do stuff which was more powerful than the sum of a single computer and do it from a personal computer on your desk, 
that sort of technology was available to far more people by 1987 than it was in any other era. Again, this is all my opinion, but I just loved the fact that you could take your PC, hook it up to a modem, and that modem could connect over a telephone line to anywhere you like, over online services, and just do stuff that you could not normally do before. But it was text-based, and I just, I don't know what it is about that sort of text-based notion, but I loved it. And that didn't stop. That it only evolved th from the eight, like the late '80s, through to the sort of mid '90s. And um, one of the biggest things for, as you'll know, for me was bulletin boards. Like I love dialing up bulletin boards, and there weren't so many bulletin boards in existence before around 1987. So I say that 1987 is one of the most pivotal years in computing. And you might go, well, that's a bit of an arbitrary, strange strange year for that to, to happen. But I think that was the year where these things really started to evolve. They were around before that, sure, and they were around after that, for sure. But this was the year where it became popular. And that, in coupled with the cool games that were coming out in 1987, the graphics just seemed a bit better. The playability seemed a bit better. People had gotten used to programming for these particular platforms, you know, the 8-bits and the 16-bits. So the games were really mature by this time. And then, and it just evolved even more in the 1988s. Um, there were a lot of, you know, things that made life easier. So, for example, um, XMS instead of EMS LIM, which was, I think, it was 1987. You know, you, it was better to manage memory with XMS, arguably, uh, on a PC. Um, Photoshop was created, so pivotal things like that. Um, we had more evolved Macs. We had a, a better processor on the PC. The 486 had come out. Um, faster machine. All of these things, in, and also the Sound Blaster card as well, which was an evolution. It was better than the AdLib card. Um, it had digital audio, where um, I kind of the AdLib was kind of um, MIDI um, only, I think. So yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and another another important time was uh, in Switzerland in the CERN labs. Of course, Tim Berners Lee had created the what was what was to be called the World Wide Web. So we still had the internet, things like Usenet and FTP and UUCP, all of these things existed, but um, a World Wide Web with things like hypertext links, this was not a thing. We had Gopher, I think, but we didn't have the web. The web was invented in 1989 and really wasn't popular until a bit later probably started getting popular in about 1993 okay so the time of the web had not started yet and now let's go into the the 90s so the 32-bit Amiga was created with the Amiga 3000 um, so hey I'd taken a leap forward um, into 32-bit land now bear in mind that the PC was already a 32-bit machine by then um, we were using software like um, the DBase. We'd used DBase 3 in the late 80s and um, maybe DBase 4, and then Borland bought up DBase. Um, now, Ashton Tate, which was a company, that, that was a really important piece of software, and Borland were well known for their compilers and stuff like that. They were a market leader. Microsoft Office was released in 1990. Uh, <clears throat> I think this was about the era of... Um, DOS 5 as well, yeah. OS 2, they were they were working in a war with Mike, with IBM, Microsoft were, at this point in time. And in August of 1991, the Linux kernel was born. Linux, a Unix-like operating system, had started to be released and it was coming to the PC. So it was a really important time for me. I wasn't using Linux in 1991. I would have to wait, I think, about eight years before I... First found, first found Linux. Um, so Windows was out by now, um, and you know things were really rapidly changing in the in the progression of the power of um, the interfaces that you were using on your PC. And although DOS five had just come out in nineteen ninety one, Windows was already out. And in fact, by nineteen ninety two, we had Windows three point one. 
and NT was kind of on its way or has already been out. Um, I think, yeah, it was still in development, but it was out in it, very soon. I think it was 1993. Wolfenstein 3D by id Software, the first proper FPS had been released. Now, there were a couple of FPSs before this by id as well, but um, it was really a, really a pivotal game. Um, the advancements in the Amiga again, the deck systems, deck stations, the first graphical web browser was evolved, uh, it was released in 1993. So that's why the web wasn't really that popular before then, because everything else was kind of like, if you think about um, links, if you've ever used links, which is a text mode um, web browser, that was what people were using, or things similar to that was what people were using. Mosaic was the first web graphical uh, browser, which you know could show inline images and so forth. And then Netscape, it came out not long after that. So a lot of you know advancements in that sort of stuff. The world was becoming a lot more um, graphical. Um, games like um, Day of the Tentacle and also Sam and, the, Sam and Max came out in 1993, but probably the biggest uh, biggest game that came out in 1993 had to be Doom. And not only was this, was this a wonderful evolution of the first person shooter, it was massive. It was just all that people were talking about. I just remember playing Doom for the first time and just seeing this at the end of 1993 and going, the world has changed. You know, it wasn't, you know, people could see Wolfenstein 3D for what it was. It was still a, a fairly basic first person shooter. Ed were still working out how to write first person shooters and the hardware requirements were completely different. When we looked at the game Wolfenstein 3D, you needed a 286 with VGA graphics. For this, you needed really a high-end 386DX, more likely a reasonably good 486. You needed minimum four megs of RAM, probably more like eight megs of RAM, whereas I think Wolfenstein could easily run in one megabyte of RAM. Um, so there was a big difference between the technical improvements of Doom, and that Doom really forced everybody to upgrade their PCs. So if they had a, a bare bones 3D6 or a 2D6, uh, basically the market looked like this. You had PCs which were still XTs or, or PC based machines that run the 8088 PC CPU. Um, there were some V20s which were basically an extension of the 8088. Um, but it, it was a lot of people still using these monochrome PCs, either that they were using CGA, maybe EGA. So there's a lot of, you know, that stuff kind of hanging around at sub 10 megahertz. Some people were using the 286 that upgraded at some point to a 286, and they were running anywhere between six megahertz and around 12, maybe even 16 megahertz. But that was it. That that was the top of what people were using. This the 386 had been out for a long time, but there was a lot of people who were still not on the 386. Multimedia hadn't really been a thing until about 1993. So having a CD-ROM drive was quite novel around until about 1993. So multimedia, faster CPUs, 386, 32-bit CPUs. VGA graphics, so this is 256 colors instead of 16 colors or four colors or monochrome. All of these things were all of a sudden really, really important. And it, the, the game Doom is a huge catalyst. I think a lot of people don't think about that, but people actually went out and bought upgrades for their PCs or bought new PCs. A lot of people did that. In fact, I think that was one of the reasons why I ended up with a 486 that year. Because before that year, it was an 8088, right? It was 4.77 megahertz. I think it was actually a Turbo XT, so it was eight megahertz. And it had 640K RAM, and it had a Hercules monochrome with a monochrome green screen display. That game changed everything. So that is not my story. That's everybody's story. There's so many people's story, and that was a big catalyst. And then, you know, games like Alone in the Dark, Command and Conquer, Theme Park, I love Theme Park, Big Little Adventure, 
full full throttle, terminal velocity. All of these games were kind of multimedia esque. They were really good graphics. You know, it was just something about that kind of era of computing. It really, really drove it. Um, and Doom was the first game to do that. Then we had Doom 2, we had um, the end of Commodore, so they declared bankruptcy, so all of the good stuff from them, for the Commodore 64, the Commodore 128, the Amiga line of computers, that was the end of the day. Um, Commodore business machines all went kind of the way of the, the way of the world, and the PC, if it wasn't clear that they were the winner, by this particular year, the PC was the clear winner. The market share of the PC eclipsed everything else. The Macintosh had lost, in fact, were pretty much languishing at this time. The Atari ST was, you know, very small market share. The PC was the clear winner. And if you didn't know it by then, you soon would do. Um, the Pentium processor came out um, and that kind of made a lot of changes. Netscape Navigator 1.0, the first big web browser, was out in 1994. Windows 95 came out in 1995. The Voodoo uh, 3D FX, 3D accelerated graphics card came out, changed gaming forever. Games like Quake came out and and used that, that graphical capability to the, to the max. And really, if I think about it, for me, between the, the days of 1987 and 1995, that was the golden age of computing for me. Like, after that, things just, I don't know, like, we moved from a world of dial-up, bulletin boards, text interfaces, kind of the underground of computer. You could build your own PC and it'd be really cool. Um, we moved from then into a world of being on the web, Everything was graphics and multimedia, and okay, that's great and more, much more accessible. We had Windows 95, goodbye to MS-DOS, really. You know, this big, nice, shiny graphical interface. Um, a lot of things really started to change. Gaming changed, but more importantly, things like JavaScript started to take hold. Uh, Windows 95 was really hardware hungry you know every year that came out of new, with new operating systems you know for dos you could run dos on any pc whether it was the bare bones ibm pc or you know a 286 or a 386 or a 486 it didn't matter you could run dos and dos had its limitations sure but you could run dos on everything windows 3.1 came out and you could you could run it on a higher end 286 or a 386 um, and then Windows 95 came out and you really needed a 486 or a Pentium for that. And every single operating system release thereafter really n ramped up the requirements. So you had uh, Windows 95, which you know really arguably needed a Pentium. Windows 98 needed a juicier Pentium. Uh, then Windows you know, XP or NT, it needed a really high-end Pentium and a, you know, a good amount of memory it really needed 16 or 32 megabytes of ram you know and it was just going up and up and up and that never ended that never stopped every version of windows or even mac os you always needed more processor power more memory and it drove the market just up and up and up um so it was a kind of cat and mouse kind of game and i don't know it like computing after that just never quite seemed as interesting i remember going my god windows sucks and it crashed all the time and it, it was it was just there it wasn't that fun for me anymore and so i swapped over to linux and spent a long time playing with linux and again i got a lot of fun out of linux but you know the days of just playing with these machines and running away at the command line it was just so much fun to me and i i don't know what it is like i, I was just a young man i was just you know, I think I was probably 18 or 19 by 1999. And I think the only way I could find fun in computing again was to go into Linux and play at the command line there. There's something about it. And if we look at the stuff that was coming out in t 2000s, again, I mean, it was the new Athlon processor, which was a gigahertz processor. Um, you know, like 
I was talking just a moment ago about processors that were 33 megahertz or you know, 66 megahertz. So we massively ramped up the processor speed from over just two or three, four years, something like that. Like it just went massively up. And, and it, it, whether that was a, a good thing, well, it probably was, but I, I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as much fun. And then, what was this? The year two thousand, we had Windows Millennium Edition. <laughs> the Pentium Four came out, Linux Kernel Two came out, Mac OS Ten or X came out, um, which was basically a port of Next Step made by Next Computers. It was run by Steve Jobs, and Steve Jobs was then taken back into Apple. Next, um, and Mac OS, like Mac OS Nine was a great operating system, albeit it was way out of touch, like it had been languishing a long time. Mac OS 7 uh, was an operating system that lasted far too long and it was lots of problems there, blah, blah, blah. Go see another video about that. There's lots of videos out there about the problems within Apple between sort of, I guess, 19, nine, late, late, late 80s all the way through to, you know, 2001 sort of thing um, and then then we started seeing mobile devices so Blackberry um, came out research in motion and in, in the in the 2000s early 2000s and you know mobile devices started really becoming popular and I think it was 2007 when we had the first iPhone right and if we just think about you know around this time, we had mobile device laptops, which were really becoming popular, um, and we had the the true mobile. We had the 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 mobile phone um, around the sort of early two thousands, and then in two thousands we had the smartphone, and then life just completely changed after that. Within three years, every single person had a smartphone. They had an iPhone, myself included, and that really got less and less fun. Things, it just started to become a tool. Now, I'm, you know, I, like everybody is addicted to these things. We're all addicted to this piece of glass in our pocket. And has life gotten any better as a result of this? Or, you know, a lot of people, especially the next generation, so not my generation, um, Gen Z or, or next gen or whatever you want to call them, a lot of people are saying, hey, this isn't actually that fun anymore. You know, we're not, we're not, like, my life is not enriched by technology. It's become encumbered by technology. The technology has started to own me. So I think there's a lot of that going on. And nothing in this world, maybe with the except, there's, there are a few, uh, we've not really had that many iPhone moments since 2007. Not in that many sort of, oh, wow, this is going to change our lives, either for the better or for the worse. And the only big one that I can really think of um, is is AI, generative AI, and that 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 kind of happened just a year ago. We, you could argue that uh, cryptocurrency is a huge thing as well. Um, I'm not convinced that the meta, you know, the augmented or virtual reality is going to be that big a thing. But you know, it it will change the world in in some way. Uh, but, but the big the big thing is generative AI and, and what's going to evolve out of that. And again, we're going to have to look back on, on that in a few years' time and say, was it a good thing? You know, it, it can't be pushed back. You can't take what we've got and push it back into the box. It's, it's out. And is that a good thing? So that brings me back round full circle to say that my, my favourite time of computing was between 1987 and 1993 those were simpler times in my opinion and they were fun and they were entertaining were they difficult sometimes did you have problems with the irq and dma settings of your sound blaster card and your cd-rom drive not working and you know a bit of a you know trying to get every single k out of your memory to get that 640k of real memory in the ms dos prompt absolutely that stuff was hella annoying but was it actually fun optimizing that boot disk to get your game of Day of the Tentacle running? It actually was. Those times were more innocent, more fun, and I don't just think it was because I was a young 
man then or a young child in fact I was still a child so was was it that no I don't think so I think a lot of people out there share the same opinion but I'd also love to see your opinions and uh, and tell me in the comments what age you were when you had your best computing experience what were you 15 or 20 or 25 what was your age as well as your uh your your um your favorite years and so that that was the period for me um anyway love to hear your comments uh this this is the sort of thing i love doing just talking off the cuff sometimes and not editing the video and not um not doing a lot of uh, messing around I just I think it's a great opportunity to speak to you um, in a way that I would do if I didn't have to go back and edit things and spend a long time making videos and it's you know this is a lot of fun so this is going up if you if you're seeing this on YouTube you're seeing it late this video is going up on Substack and on Patreon first patrons and people on Substack always always get to see it first that that is the rule and they get lots of other little articles and other good stuff as well so if you uh, want to see our stuff first and if you want to get your name up in the credits if you want to get um, lots of extra little articles then head over to patreon or to Substack as I say and you can see all that great stuff over there Costs are start from just three dollars, so you know what have you got to lose? It's not a lot of money, and it really does help the channel, and um, and it's good times, and we can talk away, and we can have a lot of fun. In fact, uh, I got a recent um, message from one of my patrons to say patrons, patrons, I don't know how you say it, to say hey, here's an idea for a video, and it's a great idea. It's about the top twenty system, so I will be doing a video just on that, and that's the beautiful thing about the. Um, the community that we have on things like Patreon. So please, if you are interested in seeing this sort of stuff, having more of an, a conversation with me, then let me know uh, and become a member on patreon.com forward slash Lab or alsgeeklab.substack.com. I'll get used to that. Or send me a super thanks here on uh, YouTube. But regardless of whatever you do, please send me a like, thumbs up, uh, subscribe to the channel, tell your friends all about it on social media. And until the next video, thank you very much for watching. I bid you adieu.